This is E! News at 7 live from Johannesburg. I'm Kathy Mushashana. These are your headlines. The ANC has killed the lights. That's the DA's new billboard campaign, replacing the controversial Esidimeni billboard. The body of the 12-year-old boy has been found after being swept away by a swollen river near Berilum in KwaZulu Natal. And Kaiser Chiefs sneak into the quarterfinals of the Left Bank Cup with three extra time goals against Minnow's Magic FC. Let's begin here. The body of the 12 year old boy who was swept away by a swollen Umgloti River in Verulam, KwaZulu Natal, has been found. The body was found by local lifeguards. On Saturday, police divers from the Durban Section Rescue were redeployed to Verulam. The search, however, was called off due to the rapid flow of water. An inquest has been opened. Tuba Vilani has the story. Very sad moment here at Verilem as the family and community members are gathered behind uh, me here where uh, just a few minutes ago they've just discovered the body of a 12-year-old boy uh, who was swept away by a heavy river yesterday when him and his friends were trying to cross to a, a sport field in Verilem where they were playing soccer. Just... Um, Earlier on, we spoke to a police spokesperson who told who they told us that they are suspending the, the, the search uh, because uh, the river was. Um, they were hoping that when they come back tomorrow, it will have uh, decreased. But uh, the community members, together with uh, um, lifeguards from Eteguini municipality, they continued searching for the body. At the same time, the family is saying that. Now they can finally get closure but, but because they are able to see and to identify the body of their love's uh, son uh, that has just been discovered. The missing boy had been an avid football player. The president of a local football association says he's saddened by the incident. It's amazing. Uh, these kids, you know, the passion that they have for the game. You know, week in, week out, they would walk from, from Waterloo and, and, all, and, and you know, come to the ground just to play, the, play a football match. We'll tell you that the passion that they have for the game and the love that they have. And, you know, we used to admire these kids. And, uh, yes, our, uh, our, you know, our, 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 uh, it, it's, it's, it's very hurting to see, you know, what happened. And we know God is in control. Funding from National Treasury for the military's operation Val River is proving more pressing than ever. Army engineers, construction personnel and troops have been in the Val since the 25th of November last year trying to resolve the wastewater crisis. Our reporter Michael Apple has more. Before the military stepped in to slowly start reviving the collapsed wastewater treatment system in the Val, the problems literally bubbled to the surface. Overflowing sewage, a common sight. But Operation Vol River is yielding results. This is primary settling tank module four at the City Beng wastewater treatment plant. It doesn't and hasn't worked for years. This is module three. Looks almost brand new. It took the military seven weeks to remove the scum on the top, empty and then finally de-sludge the tank. The army is just waiting for a new pipe. The operations commanding officer tells me they've had their work cut out for them. I'm glad to announce that there are no noticeable change um, comparing from when we arrived in November till date. The operation is meant to last 12 months. But Mahapa says that's all dependent on where the Treasury allocates an amount of 873 million rand to the operation. If we get the money as in yesterday, definitely within 12 months we'll be in a position to move out here and hand over to Mfuleni operational uh, infrastructure. NGO Save the Vol says the intervention from the military has been incredible. If you look around, you see this this pump station here, we can hear it's working right now. Mm. If you go inside, you can see there's no sewer overflowing and stuff. 873 million rand is the projected cost for the moment. It's a figure likely to balloon to a billion rand. Michael Apple in the Val.
The Democratic Alliance says the ANC's approach to the ESCOM crisis is short-sighted. It's unveiled yet another billboard bashing the governing party. The latest one highlights the electricity crisis. Yanka Tolme has that story for us. The DA's billboard that caused outrage last month. It listed the victims of the Marikana massacre and the life is a Dimeni tragedy. Many, including family members, felt it was disrespectful. Now that billboard has been replaced. This time the party is playing it safe, with the ANC killing the lights. This comes in the week when South Africa faced rolling blackouts with stage 4 load shedding. They are not able to manage Eskom. Their complete mismanagement and corruption of the institution has led to the situation now where South Africa has plunged into darkness and this has tremendous effects on the South African economy. The DA says the solution to ESCOM's problems includes privatization in an effort to break the utilities monopoly. The fact that the president's ruling it out just shows how short-sighted his approach is. We need to ensure that there's far more private sector players in the generation phase. What this will do is stimulate a whole new industry in South Africa, which will itself start to absorb unemployed South Africans. We cannot continue with the government monopoly. It is going to have to shed jobs. The party also maintains its plans will lead to cheaper electricity bills. Janka Tome, Johannesburg. Public Enterprises Minister Pravin Gordon says there are a number of issues facing ESCOM. The cash-strapped utility was forced to turn off the lights this week following a number of breakdowns at plants. Gordon has outlined issues such as staffing expertise and the question of whether the utility is actually running the power plants effectively. If we sum it up, where, where do we stand? Yes, mm. we have a, uh, let's call it structural, or as the president says, business model problem. Uh, in other words, currently ESCOM is not generating enough money to pay for its costs, uh, nor is it operating at maximum efficiency, a point I'll come back to. Secondly, uh, you have an operational problem, and that means that our plants are, on the one hand, uh, fairly old, so there's a number of the power stations of the 18 coal-powered stations that are beyond 35 years of age, mm. inverted commas, some closer to 50 years of age. Uh, Medupi and Kusile were supposed to be replacements. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and they've come with their own problems in terms of design, engineering, project execution, uh, contracting as well as we're learning. And we will be now putting all the pieces together to understand the nature of the, of the problem. But the mm -hmm. key in any business is are you, even within the constraints that we have, are you running your power plants effectively? Do you have operators that are uh, fully in command of mm. the disciplines that are actually required. Authorities in Hong Kong have seized rhinohorns worth around one million U.S. dollars. The consignment was en route to Vietnam's Ho Chi Minh City from Johannesburg. It's said to be the largest ever find in the country's history. The horns weigh 40 kilograms. Two alleged smugglers have been arrested. Custom officials said the illegal haul was transported through the terminal in two cardboard boxes. The incident comes just two weeks after Hong Kong seized a record eight tons of pangolin scales and more than a thousand elephant tusks. The country is a known transit point for the illegal wildlife trade. Coming up after the short break, delight for 24 Cape Tonians who are today handed keys to their brand new homes. It's part of the city's breaking new ground housing project. Thanks for staying with the bulletin. 24 people have been handed keys to their brand new homes in Cape Town as part of the city's breaking new ground housing project. Atim Tongana has that story. New property owners, Nopelo and Sibongi Lenongena, are finally receiving keys to their new home. They're beneficiaries of the city of Cape Town's housing program. The Nangenas have waited for this day for over 10 years. Mm. 
So all new ones are fine. Can I run away? But at least I get it today. This is one of the big calluses. Calculo, calculo, diabole. It will probably take the other 309,369 people on the city's housing database as much time as it took the Nongenas to get their new homes. And before this, the last handover was in December last year. We had uh, minor glitches last year in terms of uh, rolling out the project. And now we are sitting at 10% of the rollout of the project. So people must kindly be patient uh, because, as I've indicated as well, that the project will go on up until September. So they're still coming, if, as long as they have those papers, because that's a, con a confirmation that they are on the waiting list to get these houses and they're part of this project. So that paper guarantees them that they will get a unit. Over the coming months, more qualifying beneficiaries will receive their new homes as part of the city's commitment to provide 2,400 breaking new ground houses in this area. A Tim Tongana, Delft in the Western Cape. Back home now, and this is a good news story too. A primary school in Johannesburg has launched an innovation hub. It's aimed at inspiring pupils to come up with ideas from a tender age. One of South Africa's first humanoid ro robots, a pepper, was among the keynote speakers. Pupils from Saxon Welch Primary School could soon become innovation stars. Their needs will be met through coding and robotics. Juxtaposed with the wonders and charm of books and literature. The new innovation hub is named after the school's principal. I think it's very important for, our, for especially for our primary school children today, is that the future is going to be um, a different future from what we've had before. And these children are going to have to have these skills. They're going to have to be creative. They're going to have to uh, be entrepreneurial in order to, to uh, make a difference as adults in the society. Standard Bank partnered with the school to help make the hub a reality. We're actually going to bring technology alive in the school this year. So we're going to automate all the process here at, at the school and we're actually going to teach our kids some techniques and coding skills uh, so that they actually can take them over into the future of their lives. Pupils are excited and believe it's the start of a bright future. I love that we get to create and use our, own, our imagination. I love coding because you get to use your imagination, create new stuff and use the new applications that we get um, every time. I have trouble with my Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Robot Paper amused everyone with its ability to interact and answer questions on a personal level. According to Zimbabwe State Television, rescue workers have retrieved 24 bodies and eight survivors from two flooded gold mines near the town of Kadoma. Television footage showed some of the men in soaked, muddy clothes being helped to a makeshift clinic. Officials fear dozens more illegal miners are still trapped. Kadoma is situated around 145 kilometers southwest of the capital, Harare. Thousands of yellow vest protesters have gathered near Paris's iconic Arc de Triomphe. It's the first time they've assembled on a Sunday since the protest started three months ago. The demonstrators were also on the streets yesterday, blocking traffic in Paris's roadways. The movement sprang up on the 17th of November to counter proposed fuel taxes. It's since grown into a series of demonstrations calling for President Emmanuel Macron's resignation and more recently against the use of excessive force by riot police. It strikes, you know, some kind of fear, but voices need to be heard and this is the way to deliver it. So, you know, speak, get heard, is my view. Yeah. After the break, we have your weather details, and then we bring you a story of true love that crosses cultural lines, geographical lines, and has stood the test of time.
Welcome to the Weather Center. We're going to start off Monday with drizzly conditions going on across eastern KwaZulu Natal, including around Richards Bay. We will also be seeing partly cloudy skies for parts of northeastern South Africa and a few fog patches over the interior of the eastern Cape as well as along parts of the west coast. Then in the afternoon, it will be mostly sunny and warm to hot across the length and breadth of South Africa and more so over much of the northern Cape where we have a high fire danger alert for the central and northern parts of the province. Then in the evening, it's going to become mostly cloudy for much of KwaZulu Natal and southern Mpumalanga and we will once again see quite a bit of fog along parts of the west coast. Now we are going to see lots of sunshine on Monday for the northern Cape with hotter afternoon temperatures in most areas up in turn peaking at around 38 degrees. A mostly sunny and warm to hot Monday is forecast for the western Cape. Cape Town hitting the 30 degree mark. It will be hotter as we go towards the interior of the province. We are going to see mostly clear skies as well for much of the eastern Cape with warm to hot temperatures Port Elizabeth picking it around 25, 26 for the high in East London. Partly cloudy skies are expected for the KZN coastal areas and that just an interior bit of rain for the first half of the day for Richards Bay, warming to 27 degrees in the afternoon. It will also be mostly sunny for the park of Mpumalanga with mild to warm temperatures, just a bit of cloud around Bombela with a high of 27. Mostly clear skies are also forecast for much of Limpopo where warm to hot afternoon temperatures are expected. We stay with mostly clear skies for the park of the northwest. It will be partly cloudy, however, for Zerast and Rustenburg with highs in the lower 30s. Clear skies are going to continue on Monday for the western and northern areas of the Free State, Forest Smith, Bloemfontein and Felcom, all picking at around 31 degrees. Gauteng is going to see mostly clear skies and a high of 29 is focused around Pretoria. Now looking ahead to your Tuesday, we are going to see partly cloudy skies creeping into the eastern areas. It will be mostly sunny and hot for western South Africa. Light rain on Wednesday around George. It will be sunny and hotter for the eastern areas. And finally, they say love conquers all. And it did just that for a Vietnamese man and his North Korean wife. Their, life have, their love rather has survived over 50 years of snail mail and the Vietnam War. They first met over in North Korea where relationships with foreigners are strictly forbidden. Let's take a look. 69-year-old Vietnamese man Pham Gok Than and his 70-year-old North Korean wife, Ri Hong Hui, met in North Korea back in 1967. Relationships with foreigners were forbidden, but Than plucked up the courage to approach Ri and ask for her address. The two exchanged several letters and Than eventually visited her home, a three-hour bus ride away. He would repeat this monthly trip until he returned to Vietnam in 1973. Five years later, Than was able to meet Ri again, this time during a work-related trip. But she was becoming more despondent. <laughs> A devastating famine in North Korea during the 1990s gave Than an idea. He raised seven tons of rice in donations and then sent it to North Korea. And the gesture paid off. The North Korean government learned of Than's generosity and agreed to let them marry. The pair finally wed in the Vietnamese embassy in Pyongyang in 2002. Are giving us all plenty of reason to keep believing in love. Let's take a final look at your top stories tonight. The ANC has killed the lights. That's the DA's new billboard campaign replacing the controversial Esidimeni billboard. And the body of the 12-year-old boy has been found after being swept away by a swollen river near Verulam in Guazul, Natal. From me and the team, good night. Have yourselves a lovely week ahead.